So uh, I will hand it over to uh, Andy because we're going to hear about uh, something uh, called Haskell, which, yeah, that was a joke. <laughs> well, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm here um, representing not just Galois in some sense, but also um, for past and present Galwegians and the Haskell community at large, uh, in particular uh, the folks at MSR Cambridge, Simon Peyton Jones and Simon Marlow, uh, and the crew, uh, the company Welltypes, because they've been really instrumental in keeping Haskell alive and thriving and, uh, and growing and expanding. I'm not going to talk, you're not going to learn uh, how to program Haskell from this talk. Uh, but what I'm going to tell you about is uh, Galois' story with Haskell. Um, I'm one of the founders of Galois. And um, in the beginning, this was my impression of uh, how we started Galois. John Launchbury, Andy Gill, and Jeff Lewis have a much more nuanced and business savvy view. But uh, for me, it was. You know, basically, functional programming is the way of the future. It's the only way to manage complexity uh, and uh, help us understand what these systems we're trying to build. And we really, really love Haskell. It's great fun. In fact, you know, uh, John was, um, has been on all the Haskell committees from the beginning, so I guess he has to love it. And then, so therefore, let's start a business. Let's just go out there and say, we're really smart guys who can do Haskell. Doesn't work. Doesn't work as a business model. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure no one here is surprised to learn that. But so in the end, um, we were lucky enough, um, and I think Haskell helped us here as well, in that we were able to change uh, where we put our focus very quickly. And um, in the end, we got to uh, high assurance research and development as our main market niche. High assurance here means uh, sort of any kind of system where the uh, deployers or the users of the system really demand as much evidence and confidence and assurance in the, the correct behavior of that system, the robust behavior of that system, and the security properties of that system. Um, so we've uh, always been trying to take Haskell and push it more towards the higher end of theorem proving kinds of stuff um, to get some of that uh, strong evidence. So our mission has been creating trustworthiness in critical systems. Now, you've probably heard the words trusted and trustworthy uh, used almost interchangeably. But um, they're actually quite, quite different in a subtle way. A trusted component is one that you are forced to trust in order to use the system. In that uh, if it fails in any way, you know, the system is useless. And if it fails badly, uh, the system may in fact leak secrets and things like that. Whereas trustworthy, um, in contrast means that this component um, is worthy of that trust that you're putting in it. We good? Don't mind me, I'm just uh, getting the number. <laughs> I thought you were gonna change my slides on the fly or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna act that up. <laughs> <coughs> yes, that was trustworthiness uh, acted out by Mass Thompson. <coughs> um, in fact, I uh, at a talk I gave to uh, an audience of DOD information assurance folks. I gave those definitions for trust and trusted, trusted and trustworthiness and told them that the, I got those definitions from Wikipedia. Um, but, it, but it was okay because the Wikipedia article referred to the NSA, so it was all good. So we're a, we're a thriving business. We've been around since very late 1999. We've got our first contract um, a few months after that. At the moment, we have around 35 full-time employees. It's hard to keep track sometimes. And we're doing about $8 million a year in business at the moment. We're a research services company. That means that we take cutting-edge research from industry and from uh, other industrial researchers and try to apply them for real in real situations. And then that usually means we have to do our own research to fill in the gaps. We, uh, we've basically, at the moment, we're focusing on these six areas. You can see they're quite diverse, although they all have a, uh, a similarity in that we're talking about security here. This is also security. Here's a major mechanism for gaining security. Uh, the natural language piece is actually uh, helping us provide um, domain, domain experts with the ability to understand policies that they're, that they're given 
often in English, but they need to, uh, say, write them in Zacamole or something like that. Uh, we have a, a bunch of different software quality tools. Some of them are just uh, mostly it's software analysis, for example, um, analyzing uh, an Android app for uh, security properties. And this last one down here is uh, applied formal methods. These are all the techniques that we use to do all the rest of it, basically. So, and I keep, Haskell I think of as an, uh, an applied formal method. Um, and I'll have that argument uh, happily uh, after my talk with anybody. We also use theorem provers and model checkers and equivalence checkers and all that sort of thing. So some of you in the room, uh, especially those who have not seen Simon PJ talk about it, might be surprised that Haskell can do these kinds of things. Um, it's, uh, it's been um, a wonderful joy for us to, to be using Haskell all this time because we really enjoy programming in it. And it, it's amenable to all of these kinds of standard development things. The uh, thing I want to point out here is that we have had no trouble with Haskell and performance other than one example. I, well, one example I'm willing to talk about uh, that, I'll, that I have a slide on later. But in fact, what we found is being able to think about your algorithms at a high enough level, or sometimes the right level, it may not be the highest level of abstraction, enables you to do optimizations in a really profound way that allow you to choose the correct method for doing something rather than uh, working out about cache misses and pointers and things like that. But, uh, but basically, in the beginning, we made that choice because it was a language we all loved and knew. So what I want you to try to get out of this talk, um, and I'll try to make that as easy as possible, uh, is that you know, we've used other languages, but we always come back to Haskell whenever it makes sense, and we still love it. And I want to tell you about the reasons that we still use it, basically. So I'm going to start off with uh, just a couple of case studies. Uh, I'll go into more detail on the, the first one. Um, and I can go into more detail on, I will present the second two, but I can go into more detail uh, offline on those. So, this first case study uh, I think of as exemplifying the power of Haskell with regards to abstraction. I'm not talking about um, Lambda, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Lambda, or closures or things like that. But really I'm talking about abstraction as that uh, cognitive ability that uh, all humans have to see patterns in the world, to combine patterns, uh, to abstract. Um, this is a key creative ability. And, uh, and it's especially important, I think, for programmers. So let's talk about the Haskell Lightweight Virtual Machine, or HalVM. The HalVM is essentially a port of the Glasgow Haskell Compiler's runtime system to a bare Zen domain. That is, normally when you run uh, a domain in Zen, uh, is everyone familiar with Zen? Good, no? No, okay. Um, Zen is a hypervisor in the Linux tradition. Um, by which I mean it, uh, it generally, it uh, virtualizes Linux very well and other things better. Uh, better than it used to, but not, not so good. Um, it's a very simple little thing. All it does is provide its virtual machines with memory um, and some events and channels, and that's it. Everything else has to be done by the domain. So generally people run uh, Linux inside one of these containers so that they get the full, uh, full power of an operating system. But one of the things that we noticed was that in Haskell, you've got just about everything you want from an operating system, but in a high-level language with strong types and all that sort of lovely stuff. And Zen with Haskell on top is a lot smaller than Zen with Linux and then Haskell. Because uh, Zen is about, depending on how you count, 150k to 200k lines of C. Uh, Linux uh, also depending, but can be a, a uh, much larger. The Haskell runtime itself, uh, let's say it's 100k at the moment, probably 50, 50 to 100k. If you're wanting to make uh, an assurance argument about some Haskell program that you've written and does something very simple, say it's an inline encryptor, um, your trusted computing base would then include your Has the Haskell program, GHC runtime, Linux operating system, and Zen, and then the hardware underneath. So what we did exactly, basically was remove the Linux out of that trusted computing base. 
And you get, we get some benefits just, just by getting rid of Linux in the sense that we can create a lot more domains than you can using the standard Linux size. So here's what the, the architecture looks like. We took Xen, um, we didn't touch it. In the beginning, we had to remove privilege checks, but we don't need to do that anymore. And on t underneath the GHC runtime, we slipped in a very small uh, subset of libc that we needed, and, very, and just enough of a shim between the kinds of system calls that GHC required and what was provided as hyper calls by Xen. So that means, so for example, the fact that we have a, an impoverished libc means that we don't have file systems uh, or networking uh, or, or device drivers. Um, so all of that has to be written in Haskell. And it's quite a nice uh, hierarchical thing out there. We've got this nice rendezvous lib at the top and our very own uh, file system, TCP IP stack and all that sort of thing. And uh, so it's a... A system in which you can run nigh arbitrary uh, Haskell programs on Zen. There's a few things that uh, are still not supported. But it runs on Fedora 16, 64 bit, out of the box. We have libraries for doing uh, Haskell typed channels over VMs that are very easy to use. Hans and Hafs, I've already talked about a little bit. Um, we've written a lot of device drivers. This is the most surprising thing for me to be able to write a low-level device driver, and I'll give some code uh, later for a wireless driver that we wrote. Um, it is, it's actually really fun, because my background is in programming language semantics. I did a PhD on operational theories for McCarthy's AMB in a call-by-need context. So miles away from writing device drivers. Um, I didn't even know how they worked when we started doing this stuff. Um, but it's been really fun. Um, one, of the, but one of the most useful things that we found is that because these VMs are very lightweight and you can write them in Haskell, it's really easy to just uh, throw up a prototype of something very quickly. Um, even if it's a, uh, a complicated architecture of, of VMs. So we've been working on secure architectures, say for uh, mobile communication, using these similar ideas where you want to isolate certain pieces of functionality with respect to least privilege so that they can only do what they have to do. And, um, so this sort of virtualization is a, is a key way to doing that. Um, could also use, we've used this for uh, orchestrating farms of VMs where they need to communicate with each other and, um, or you have one that's responsible for starting up and shutting down all the other ones and things like that. Um, and those two things together make it really useful for exploring operating system design, particularly in the mobile world, but also in the sort of server farm kind of world, like robustness and things like that. Oh, I should say the, uh, the title there, that's what I tell my uh, three-year-old. This is not a toy, it's a tool. And for her it means, please don't play with it. Uh, but for you guys, what I want you to get out of it is this is real. You can go and download it at halvm.org and start writing um, Haskell programs in Zen. So here's an example, some example code of um, low-level driver code in Haskell. So who here has never seen Haskell code before? All right, well, I'll talk to you three later. <laughs> um, this, but this, is a, this is a function um, which, given a set of interrupts, um, will enter a critical section, work out what the hardware mask is, and uh, then set the interrupts on the hardware device using these write mem and read mem. So this is a, these two are registers and this is a value being written to a register. Um, this code actually took us a long time to get right, um, even though it's very simple. And the trick was that um, we weren't doing this read after each write because we're software engineers and reads that you ignore the value of, I mean, there's no point in doing them, right? Except when it's hardware, because uh, side effecting, there's a side effecting read there, which actually has the effect of, uh, of in some sense, committing the, the write you just did, which was very confusing for us. But in, at the same time, this, this code is at precisely the right level of abstraction for what we're doing here. We're just doing some reading and writing of mem. Each of these breaks down into something more complicated as well. 
like poking offsets into memory registers and things like that. There's some uh, higher level code. Um, and this is, called, this is called just after uh, the card attaches. So there's some power saving and it's going to update the transmission power. It's going to set off the uh, receive engine so we're ready to start receiving packets. And then we're going to mask certain kinds of things that we want to, that we want to get interrupted on. And then we'll turn the light on. Um, it, so this, this code also, each of these things breaks down into something much, much, much more complicated. Um, but it's, we're able to get just, this is exactly what start does. It looks like pseudocode for the, for the thing. This is actual running code. Oh, I meant to say at the beginning. A lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about, everyone in here is going to go, well, I can do that in my language. Or I can do, the, I can do it, maybe I can do it better in my language. I'm not here to make you all start using Haskell. So that's one thing. The second thing is, um, I'm glad you can do it in your language, and that's fantastic you can do it in your language, because I want us all to be writing in the, the language that's best for us, for the, for the tools that we're using. My claim is only that a lot of these things I'm talking about, don't, uh, you don't get that whole set of these things in uh, many other languages. And there's just something about the aesthetics of Haskell that really appeals to us too. Um, but of course, I don't want to, don't want to give you the impression that um, Haskell solves all. So that, that code that I was showing was actually built, uh, part of a wireless driver that we built from, a, from the uh, C code corresponding to the wireless driver in Linux because that was the best and only documentation available. Um, we had, we, one or two of us knew something about Mac 80211 frames and a few other folks had used wireless networks before, but basically we were complete nudes. Had no idea about all of the nasty physical stuff that is important for a good wireless uh, setup to work, like all the radio pieces. And the side affecting reads really, <laughs> really bothered us. But in the end, we, we, we had a working wireless driver, um, but it was very slow. We maxed it out at about 30 kbps. And unfortunately, uh, we didn't get time to spend more than a, two days on uh, performance tuning it. Um, and it went from 30 kbps to 30 kbps in the two days. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, we didn't find the, uh, the problem. Um, my suspicion is that uh, what we needed was something in, in the underlying concurrency runtime to give us some mild priorities in certain cases. So for the, the interrupt handler seemed to be getting starved. But we didn't have time to uh, push on that any further. But now the code's out there. Someone else could. Um, but the big project we did with this was one that, uh, when it was running, I think would have something like 15, 10, 12 to 15 VMs, um, including one of which was a Windows, I think it was XP uh, VM. And it was completely sequestered from the outside world without its knowledge. All of its network traffic um, went through a VPN. I can't say much more about the details of the VPN other than to say we got through the VPN uh, we were able to get six meg per second uh, throughput. So we could stream uh, HD, 1080p HD video from, from this sequestered VM through, through all of the infrastructure that we had in there for the VPN out to a uh, laptop outside the, the TCB. Uh, the, we have to keep updating this because what we, what we use for that demo is, a, is the latest, greatest uh, sci-fi trailer. So when this was done, it was a Star Trek movie. I'm not sure what we, should, what we would pick now, maybe Inception. Well, a bit out of date. Um, and we wrote that in about four months. Um, five, five really separate components um, and around 50K Haskell. But because, of, uh, because we were able to design the interfaces between these VMs using these typed inter-VM communication channels, uh, and, and other, other factors, we were able to integrate all of that in one week, um, including testing. Uh, there was a space leak that we found, um, and it was very quickly identified. And uh, we were two months ahead of schedule, and uh, I think maybe three orders of magnitude uh, above the performance goal that the client had set. Uh, so, I, I claim that uh, that would not have been possible in many other languages. And the, and, the, and the fact that we were able to 
tune the abstraction to the right point at, for each in each uh, in each code segment was uh, just great. So that's uh, virtualization and abstraction. Um, domain specific languages are a key technique or a key thing uh, that we do because uh, when you get domain specific, you get to you get to focus in just on the problem that you care about, which means that you don't have to prove things for all programs, for example, you only have to prove them for programs that fit within that tiny little box that you've got. So it's a way of managing, um, managing complexity and size of things, not some stuff. So this is a picture of a, uh, can't quite tell, it's actually a six foot long model, uh, which is running Copilot, which is a, a project we did with NASA. And it was it basically for runtime monitoring um, the the code that we generated would sit on the on the on the plane monitoring uh, various control programs that were, were going on and making sure they didn't get out of certain bounds. Um, so and it's being used basically. I mean, yeah, here we go. So real time distributed reactive systems. And the idea is that you really want you want something that you want to develop code that you know is going to fit all these things, but at runtime. You want, you know, it's belt and suspenders. You want that little bit of extra protection that just in case something goes wrong that my Isabel theorem prover didn't include in his assumptions about the environment, uh, then I'll know what's going on. So all of these monitors do the same kind of thing. They sample external variables, uh, they update their internal state, and then check for trigger conditions and repeat. So they're very simple, and they all run in constant space. So we could have started writing them in, in C directly, uh, but instead, we didn't know what the right constructs would be for, to begin with. So we started playing around in Haskell just using uh, an, as an embedded DSL, which means that we wrote higher order functions in Haskell that corresponded to the kinds of uh, behaviors we wanted to express in these monitors. And that enabled us to uh, experiment uh, with different kinds of constructs very easily without having to build up and tear down a lot of infrastructure. Uh, we also had uh, two independent backends uh, that were uh, proven functionally equivalent by an equivalence checker. Now, the reason that we did two different backends, and they're, they're quite separate in their command paths, is that we wanted to have some assurance in the tool chain itself. So this gives us, we start off on the same spec and we get two different things and we check that they're equivalent at the end. So here's a small uh, example. Now this is written in Copilot, which looks a lot like Haskell. It's not quite Haskell. Um, what this function does is it just sets up a trigger so that if the temperature in the engine gets above a certain size, then it shuts it off, say. Or at least it, so it, it lights up the button that says uh, temperature is too high. So what we've got basically is a stream of temperature values that are being sampled on this external. And this is the condition, the two conditions, I'm sorry, um, that we're actually, uh, that the, the system is running, and uh, that we've uh, risen, we've gotten above the temperature, um, sorry, the temperature um, threshold. So the way that we do that is we check, uh, we take the current value and we compare it against uh, one coming two, two time steps down. And if the difference has been, is greater than 2.3, then that's too high. Um, these are stream equations, uh, which I can go, to in more, go into more detail with, um, offline. But it's a really nice, concise way of just expressing this thing. We're just saying, drop the first two uh, temps off that list and then compare them against the rest of the list. The copilot, one of the interesting things about these kinds of things as well is that this was, this tool chain reused um, just about everything. Quick check is, is, is all very simple and nice. The Atom backend done by uh, Tom Hawkins um, is a nice, really nice uh, backend for generating embedded C code written in Haskell, so we were able to use that. There's a symbolic bit, bit, bit vector backend uh, that we also used, and we show those two equivalent through model checking. We're also getting some correspondence here between the copilot core 
which can be evaluated by an interpreter, and the atom back end, and we can check uh, with quick check that they agree on uh, lots of test values. But it was very easy to use all of these, uh, all of these packages just because, again, uh, Haskell gives us a lot of nice abstractions and uh, it's really easy to plumb things in like that. Um, we tend to use DSLs not just because they give us a productivity bump because you're just focusing on this one uh, domain, but also uh, they make uh, generating formal evidence much more tractable because instead of, in the normal case, you've got a general purpose programming language, so you need a general purpose theory about that programming language and then you need a general purpose theorem prover, etc., etc. And you're proving theorems for all programs. Very difficult stuff. But if you restrict your domain to, I'm only interested in these programs that can run in constant space that have this, this sort of, these sort of features, there's far fewer behaviors that they can exhibit. So making a proof about them, and particularly using a model checker or an equivalence checker, uh, who the, their uh, usefulness depends on the size of the state space. If you can restrict the state space, um, then you can get these really powerful push button tools that just give you really strong evidence. So often you can actually, you can even generate the evidence along with the code. So you can, so Copilot is an example of this, of a verifying compiler, not verified, it's verifying, it produces the evidence along with the code. So you can go and check that evidence in your trusted third party uh, proof checker. And DSLs, the great thing about DSLs is they're a way to empower the experts. Don't make your experts uh, learn to program. Give them a language that they already know, like, in this case, the Copilot stuff. All right, now, on to high-performance, secure, multi-party communication. Uh, so this one is, is uh, I'm hoping, will uh, exemplify the kinds of optimizations that are possible in these high-level languages. So what is um, homomorphic encryption? Has anyone heard of that? A couple of people. Anybody heard of fully homomorphic encryption? I expect the same hands will go up. So the, the answer to this question at the bottom here is, is yes, with fully homomorphic encryption. Um, it's not feasible yet. It's, I think, at last count, 11 orders of magnitude <laughs> beyond, <laughs> beyond feasibility. <coughs> uh, we're actually working on a, a, a DARPA project with a bunch of folks to try to bring that down by three or four orders of magnitude. But the, the, it really is the ideal for, for secure cloud computing where all of my data is encrypted up in the cloud. I, want, I have some, say, search function or something. I encrypt that and throw it at the cloud and the FHE operations up in the cloud give me back an encrypted result. And they've not had to decrypt anything up there. So now I can decrypt my result and it's completely safe. So once we get that 11 orders of magnitude thing worked out, oh, I must say, we didn't invent fully homomorphic encryption. That was uh, Craig Gentry at IBM. So here are a couple of other kinds of secure computation. So normal crypto is homomorphic in that you know, some of the operations uh, distribute. So fully homomorphic we've already talked about, and it is currently infeasible. There's two other, um, there's two sort of uh, stepping stones on the way to fully homomorphic encryption, secure multi-party communication and shared computation. Um, this has actually been used um, in a beat auction in Denmark where the uh, participants want to make bids and receive bids, but they don't want anyone else to know what their bids are. All they want to know is, did they win? So they actually used uh, secure multi-party communication uh, in this option uh, with, with great results. But I'm going to talk about this shared computation where the computation is uh, distributed across servers in such a way that it is information theoretically secure. That is, you can't discover anything about what they're talking about unless you have all of the information. Um, and I believe that the information theoretically secure nature is due to the fact that XOR is uh, key in this. Here's another example of a use case where you want to know, is my satellite going to collide with any other satellite? I don't want anybody to know where my satellite actually is, but I do want to know 
if I'm in danger of, uh, of running into someone. So this is another case where there's a shared computation going on. We don't want everybody to know all of the secrets, though, or we don't want anyone else to be able to discover them while we're doing that computation. Another use case might be um, you know, getting directions from point A to point B without letting anyone know what points A and B are. Uh, so this is going to be um, po possibly a little too fast to follow because it's a complicated thing. I do have a big deck of slides about this if anyone wants to hear any more of the detail. Um, but the basic idea is that we've got these, these shared computers and they've got a secure connection between them, secured by AES probably. Um, and what we're doing is we're splitting up this value x that we need, want to do shared communication on into three parts. And we can... We can recreate it. If we've got all three parts, we can recreate it with XOR. Um, and that, those, those XI tend to be drawn from, they're drawn from some random distribution. So you'll note that because we're using XOR, that even if you have two of the values, you really can't tell anything about the third because, because of the nature of XOR. It, uh, it sort of masks a lot of information that way, masks where that information came from. So we can exploit that and start breaking up uh, the values, the x and y values that we might need to calculate now for multiplication. There's a multiplication table. Uh, we break them up into their, into their component parts and then move those off to the other machines. Now, this, this multiplication into the uh, ith element of the xy multiplication, you'll see that we can recreate it using that, uh, that breakdown, and that's the key. Now, most expensive operation in these kinds of situations is the multiply, because it involves communication. Um, for example, here, what we're doing is sending the values u and v to my right-hand partner and receiving back their values p and q. Um, and then we're, we're implementing this multiplication in here. So we need, to, we need to find some way to do the multiplication uh, efficiently. Now, the current state of the art required four multipliers to do the full multiplication. Um, John Launchbury was able to uh, take, take his very high-level algorithm, which he started off with just list of bool, possibly the most inefficient representation of bit strings that's ever been invented. But it is very simple, it's very intuitive, and Haskell loves lists. So there's lots and lots and lots of uh, infrastructure for doing things with lists. And, so in that, and, and it's also become a very natural thing. For, if you've been programming in Haskell for probably more than a year, then you know, lists become a, a part of you. So, so John played around in the, in the, in the list of bool world and optimized things at that level. But really what he was trying to do was come up with what are, the, what, are the, what are the actual operations at the heart of this multiplication? What are the things that I, need, that I should be looking at trying to optimize? And then he changed the bit representation to something efficient like Word. But that only required changes to the underlying combinators. The, whole, the higher level stuff was all still just as it was before. And in both cases, the, the uh, optimizations, I mean, he did optimizations at all levels here. But they were all derived from the real semantics, the mathematical semantics of the computations he was trying to describe. The, he would, the, I'd say, easily translated to Haskell. Well, he was actually using Haskell notation to do these proofs anyway. So it's, uh, it was a very easy translation to, to bring those optimizations into the code. And the, being able to split things up into you know, super inefficient, but easy to work with, and then let's get more efficient with the representation here, made it possible to actually find a lot of these optimizations. And I'm getting the uh, wind-up sign. Um, so there's a circuit diagram for, you can tell it's very efficient, right? But these are the three multipliers I was talking about. Um, and just the removal of one multiply actually um, makes this whole notion of shared computation uh, feasible. In fact, we, 
we think it's sufficient for doing uh, secure multi-party VoIP. Not quite for video, but uh, for voice. So, I mean, the, and the key here is that the code and the algorithm and the underlying mathematical semantics were not the same, but close enough that moving between them was really easy. And that, um, uh, well, apart from applying John Launchbury's brain power to the problem, that led to two orders of magnitude uh, better than state of the art by removing one multiplier in a month. All right, um, I've got to wrap up. So I'll try to give you a sense of why do we still use Haskell? You know, in the beginning, it really was a sort of almost a default choice. Um, so a lot of these talks end up with laundry lists like this sort of thing with uh, you know, very fuzzy notions like semantic gap. Um, but I'd like to talk about abstraction and just focus on that slide. So as I was saying before, abstraction is this thing that all humans do, looking for patterns, making patterns, describing them. And it's a really fun thing to do, you know, noticing, noticing some key element of a, of, of, um, a program that, that shows you the perfect elegant solution is just really exciting. Um, abstraction is our, really our only tool in managing complexity, not just in programming, but in the world. You know? um, and I really think that everyone in this room who's a programmer who enjoys programming is really good at abstraction. You're really good at seeing patterns and using them and reusing them and manipulating them and updating them, etc. So I would say that Haskell really supports this kind of work, this kind of abstract thinking and design um, for a couple of sort of uh, mundane reasons. I mean, it's very easy to name something in Haskell. You don't even have to give it a type. You can just say x equals blah. So you can very easily take a large complicated computation and call it something descriptive without, not, without having to do lots of braces and I've got to do this prototype line and this other thing. <clears throat> so that's, that's a really handy thing. It's, you know, it's not the only thing, but it's really useful. Refactoring is key. This is how we go from a, an early design exploration prototype to a real thing, is basically by uh, pulling out all the things that work well and, uh, and trying to um, basically focus in, you can focus in on one subpart, even just a function, and optimize the hell out of that without worrying about the rest of the other code. And while you're doing all of this sort of exploration, the strong type system keeps you uh, safe and honest, but for free. Now, um, this last thing here, tune your zoom. By that I mean, imagine, well for me, I, I mean we still do write C code and Perl and JavaScript and all the rest of it. And I find that when I'm working in languages that aren't Haskell, that I can't vary uh, how close I am to the work. Sometimes writing in C feels like I'm standing next to a wall like this. And I can see just the, the pointers that I'm looking at there. I don't get a big picture sense. It's very hard to get a big picture sense. But when but with Haskell, at least the way that that we've come to use it, it's, it's much easier to just tune your way to the right abstraction just by you know, fact, refactoring things out, putting in a monad, whatever. And the key is that hiding details in a monad, for example, you're all waiting for that word to come out, aren't you? <laughs> hiding, hiding details like that uh, exposes the key thing you're trying to get done, whether it's the, the algorithm or the control flow or whatever. And you can then say, ah, that's the, that's the thing, and I'm just going to write a generalized form of that control flow. Everything else is just instances. All right, so final slide. So like I said, we started off using Haskell uh, because we loved it. And we still love it, but you know, that's not really enough to keep making a bet um, uh, in a business sense. But all these, other, all these things I've written up here that it brings to the table, um, choiceful abstraction, being able to choose the right abstraction for what you're doing right then, and then changing it in the next function, it's just, it's very powerful. And it enables you to hone in on what you're actually trying to do, and it makes it easier for you to explain your code to someone else. So it's good for maintenance as well. I mean, and getting domain specific for expressiveness and formal evidence generation and all that great stuff, Haskell is really good for that. 
uh, the semantics based reasoning. There are lots of languages that support this very nicely. And but this is this is just so powerful, and I don't think it's been used enough uh, these days. And, and like I said, we can connect to formal evidence when we need to. But the bonus for me, especially, and actually for all of the developers at Galois, is that working in Haskell, it's it's beauty, it's elegance, uh, it's all these things. It's really, really fun. It's just uh, that, that's the real reason we still use Haskell because it's it's. I was about to swear then I shouldn't do that in a public. Uh, Forum. It's just really, really great fun. And um, I think there's other Haskellers in this room that will tell you the same thing. Now, again, I'm not saying you should all start using Haskell now. Wouldn't hurt. But, um, <laughs> but uh, really, you know, think about your language or the languages that you use to do your job. Do you need them to support this kind of thing? Do they support that kind of thing? Uh, I just want you to think about it like that. Okay, last slide. There we go. Um, before I open up for questions, I just wanted to point out we're actually offering uh, professional training services in Haskell the way that we use it. Um, so come and talk to me afterwards if you're interested. Or send me an email. Okay. Questions? Andrew. So it was interesting to see you using about abstraction. It was interesting to see you enthusing about abstraction, and I'm glad you now understand that you should use abstraction to hide big things with lots of hairy detail. But you don't yet seem to get, you should also use abstraction to hide little things that don't have hairy detail, but should be thought about at a different conceptual level. So For on your example? slide of write memory, uh -huh. and you said a couple of times, and we have to follow it by these read memory things, and that's because the way the memory system works, we have to commit, and you didn't abstract away no, into write memory and commit. Yes. Right? And then later on, there was a line where you we did actually have something a about an LED, and you <laughs> yes. said, and that turns the light on. So yeah. why not have a function called turn the light on? Indeed. We did. It's so only it's one line. It doesn't have very detail, but it's absolutely. a different conceptual I agree. level. I absolutely agree. So there are more opportunities for, op uh, for optimization and abstraction in that code base uh, than you've mentioned just now. But we did have a... Um, a real, you know, a committed right and things like that, but um, it was actually only ever used in one case. In that case, <laughs> it, do it does matter when you've only got six months worth of funding to finish the driver. That's when it matters. So I'm going to cut it short here. Okay, we're out of time. Uh, but big hand uh, to Andy. <laughs>